Good morning. My name is Moss Subramanian from Oregon State University. Um, I started in Oregon State University in 2006. Uh, prior to Oregon State University, I spent uh, 22 years in DuPont Company in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, in an experimental station. That's one of the research center, uh, which is uh, one, of the, one of the oldest research center in the U.S., started in 1796. Um, so I, after that, I, after 22 years of uh, uh, experience in industry, I decided to go to university to teach so that I can propagate what I learned to others from the industry. So um, prior to that, I did my PhD from um, India, Indian Institute of Technology, and my postdoctoral, I did a postdoc at the Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas, and then I joined DuPont Company in 1984. So um, when I the reason I'm in this area is uh, because I was visiting the Indian Corporation uh, because we made some discovery recently. It was quite well um, um, uh, kind of uh, received by the entire scientific community as well as the industry because of the interest in uh, paint technology as well as uh, coatings and so on. So I thought since it contains indium, so the Indian Corporation always showed interest in um, um, in this area, actually, because they're always, always looking for new opportunities, which can be, which can involve indium, because that's that's what the company name, Indium Corporation. So indium is an element in the periodic table, as you all know. Uh, so I thought today I'm going to give you some brief um, background about the uh, what is the discovery, what we did, and how, we, how it came by. Um, this, this discovery was not a planned discovery; it was one of the serendipity. Uh, we were actually not looking for a, a big one because that is not my area of expertise, but uh, yeah, at least the area, uh, although the pigments are still inorganic compounds actually, so since I'm an inorganic chemist, I know what they are, but I never really showed interest in working in this area because I thought it's a very mature area. But now I feel like it is uh, something we discovered looks so, so novel, so, so we are now continuing to work in this area a lot. People who are not familiar with Oregon State University are, it's located in the northwest uh, uh, area in, uh, in Oregon, which is a uh, town called, small town called Corvallis. You have a Pointer, which you can. I'm sorry. That you have pointer. Pointer. Uh, okay. No, no, no problem. If you don't have it, we can manage the problem. But um, which is about uh, um, close to the, right here in the Carvalis, which is a very small town, a university town between Eugene and uh, Portland. Uh, so it's one of the oldest university in Oregon. Uh, I think it was uh, I think 150 years old now. So it's, uh, you can see the mixture of. Uh, quite a lot of old buildings and new buildings. Uh, some of them are really old. Uh, what they're called historic buildings, as it does, so they can't any, anymore remove it, but they can always renovate it. So they really kept it up as much as possible. And it's located, and it's located in a very beautiful area of, uh, of, the, of the country where we are surrounded by a lot of uh, you know, uh, Cascade Mountains as well as uh, not very far from the ocean, which is about 40 miles from the ocean, actually. So also we have a beautiful Crater Lake, which is uh, one of the beautiful area of the, of the State. Uh, this is my group. Um, we work on. Uh, uh, we, 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 uh, I have what right now. The three graduate students have finished last year, so I have uh, now nine PhD students working with me, and also have two postdocs. So um, some of them who worked in this project have already left and joined the company, which makes pigments. <laughs> Andrew Smith, which is uh, he's in Ohio now because the company is located in in, uh, in Columbus, Ohio. So. And also the, the student who, who did Hiroshi Mesoguchi is a professor in Tokyo Institute of Technology now. I have some collaborators in UCSB and so on. So one of the reasons I came to uh, university is to work with some young students because in DuPont we always have a, a colleagues who are as old as me most of the time. So it would be nice to have some young generations learn how to do research and uh, teach them the excitement of doing research actually. Um, normally we, uh, whenever we discover new materials, we rationally try to design it. That's, that's what we do in most of the cases. But uh, that way, that we can, uh, since we are chemists, we try to control the chemistry, how we can design new materials for new applications. Sometimes we also have a, what we call as a guided serendipity. We are looking for some interesting material in one area. We end up in finding another area. In some cases, we can get a, a discovery, which we call as a miracle moment, because we totally unexpected uh, results, which uh, yeah, which is normally you don't, you don't even think about it till it happens. Uh, the only thing is you got to be smart enough to understand um, that there is something discovery here. Actually, you know, you know, there are a lot of examples in the in the really in the in the in history that uh, pencil discovery to mineral discoveries are, are totally 
unexpected actually. So I'm going to give some examples of that or how we discovered our, our pigments. Um, there's, we, we always, uh, in our group, we always look for holy grails. One of the, some of the holy grails we are looking for are the room temperature superconductors, which is, uh, which is one of the uh, future, um, uh, you know, everybody, everybody is hoping that one day we'll have room temperature superconductor where we can have uh, applications, uh, we can transmit electricity without any resistance, it's of copper wires. Uh, we can also have elevated trains and there's a lot of uh, dreams about it. We have a t superconductor which can superconduct up to 140 Kelvin now, but the room temperature superconductor is a dream because still, you know, one has to do everything at room temperature, not at low temperatures actually. Then there are other areas also we are interested in con converting energy uh, where we can take uh, uh, heat to electricity like in thermoelectrics. And we are also interested in a lot of lead free uh, electronic materials because lead is uh, one of the problem in uh, environmentally, you know, one of the uh, um, um, difficult to handle lead. So we decided that we need to find materials which are lead free, especially what we call piezoelectrics, which is used in inject printers and so on, containing lead. So we try to see whether we can come up with a, with a uh, materials which are lead free. So these are our, our some of the areas we work in our group. Um, I'll skip this slide and go to the next one. The, the, the focus of our research is an uh, interesting one is uh, uh, what we call designing materials for spin electronics. Uh, we, are, we know what is the magnetic materials mean, we also know what is the capacitor means. We are trying to combine a material which is simultaneously a ferro magnetic material and a ferro electric material. Uh, such a way that we can make devices which can be a magnetically oriented devices or electrically oriented devices. So we call them as magnetoelectric or uh, spin electronics actually. So in these cases, we try to find materials which can be designed having a two property in the same material, which is not easy in the, uh, to do because uh, a material which acts as a capacitor will not be a magnetic, a material which is magnetic and cannot be a capacitor actually. So, so we thought maybe this is the best way to do it is to, uh, to design the materials and see whether we can, we can come up with the, uh, with, with the interesting material actually. So um, the, 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 the materials we are working on are interesting, um, what you call oxides. Uh, they are, uh, they are, so we are trying to create a material by mixing two different atoms in the crystal structure. One is um, in, the case of, in the case of manganese and indium uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a site which is, uh, which, which is uh, surrounded by five oxygens. So in, in, in fact, uh, um, when we try to design these materials, we, we, um, we, we thought by simply mixing a material which is ferromagnetic and also a ferroelectric, that means the capacitor material, we can come up with a new way of creating multi-ferroics or uh, multi-functional materials. So that is what the whole idea of, uh, of doing this, uh, this research uh, about. Uh, when I wrote a uh, um, proposal for NSF National Science Foundation, this is exactly the, uh, the, the objective is to create multi-ferroics and we got about uh, yeah, half a million dollar funding from them for three years. So it just, this is really a, a, a discovery type research, but sometimes it doesn't happen um, or what we do is, when we try to do this research, we finally end up in creating some beautiful new, new, new compounds, which happen to be you know, some of the best pigments ever known um, in, the, in the area of uh, pigment chemistry. So that's what we call brilliant blues came out of the blue actually, because <laughs> we are not looking for it. We just uh, it so happened, uh, but because of my experience in Dupont Company, I know the blue pigments are very difficult to create. So that is how we say, we, 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 I realized that when I look at the compounds, when, it, when my students told me the, the, uh, the, the compounds, I realized, my God, how blue it is. Actually, uh, I have some samples here, which the company has made some paint panels. I, I'll show you there uh, after, the, after, the, after my talk. Um, when we start making these compounds, we normally take the oxides of the three elements, indium, yttrium, and manganese. We take indium oxide, yttrium oxide, and manganese oxide. We mix them up and then heat them at uh, 1200 degrees Celsius in air. So, although the, none of them is col colored, as you can see the colors, uh, I hope that we can dim the lights maybe a little bit, is that possible? Mm -hmm. So that we can see the colors better, I could tell there's been a lot of colors in this. Mm -hmm. Amount of yttrium and manganese in the lattice, uh, in the crystal structure. So this, although they are not a very good, um, happen to be a multi ferroic material, which we, which we are actually uh, hoping to make, but they happen to be some of the beautiful blue, uh, pigments. Uh, they, in, in fact, one of the reasons why these pigments have become so popular because we can actually change the color of the pigment by simply changing the ratio of the manganese and indium in the crystal structure. So you can actually go from a very light blue 
a very dark blue to nearly black by simply increasing, changing the manganese to indium ratio in the starting material of this compound. So the question is, what is the pigment? Uh, I'm sure you know, you all, we all drive cars and we all uh, have homes which, which, which contain paints. Uh, and also we have seen a lot of beautiful paintings by many famous painters from the Middle Ages. So I, uh, the, well, the color is primarily given by because of the selective absorption of a wavelength of a material actually. If it, if, if it, if, if, if it absorbs all the, all the colors, then you're going to have a black. If it reflects all the colors, you're going to have a white. But there's always a selective absorption of certain wavelengths. When, when a certain wavelength is absorbed, only the only certain wavelength of the color is reflected. Uh, for example, in this case, the red and green is absorbed, only the blue is reflected actually. So this is, you can tune the material, this depends on the chemical composition of the pigment uh, um, uh, we, we have developed actually. So you can have a red pigments, you can have a, like mercury sulfite and so on, you can have a blue pigment or green pigments, or you can even other colors, which I'll show you some of the colors we have made actually. The pigments are used in many ways, as we know, to, to for simply for a for, for a aesthetic value and also for the painting for the Middle Ages and also uh, to protect the, uh, the surface of a material of, of a of a of a object like a car or a, like a house. At the same time, you want to have colors because you want to have aesthetically looking good, actually. Uh, but nowadays, the car paints are so advanced. Uh, there's no rusting problem now. You remember in, in, in 70s and 80s, the cars always got rusted well, more, much more than today because the paint uh, technology has improved a lot. So the pigments are not uh, easily decomposed by the light or the ultraviolet light or the infrared radiation. So they really, they, uh, they, so this uh, industry is looking for better paints, uh, which can give rise to good colors as well as uh, uh, good protective properties. Actually. You, you know that there is a difference between a pigments and dyes. Dyes are mostly used in dyeing our clothing and so on, uh, mainly for the fibers, um, um, uh, printing and things like that. But in the case of the uh, pigments, mostly they are inorganic based compounds. It's just like uh, titanium dioxide is a white pigment. We have a cobalt blue, which is a cobalt aluminum oxide, which is a, an inorganic oxide. But most of the dyes are organically based. That's why the dyes can easily fade. When you, when you leave your shirt in sunlight for about three, two or three days, you can see the color get faded because the organic compounds are easily decomposed. So they are normally used in indoors and also mostly used in clothing because it's easy to use them to color the, color the material actually. But most of the pigments are used for coatings like in cars and housing, also the roofs and so on. So those paintings uh, are mostly inorganic based because they are very highly robust and they, they can be easily applied at the same time they are more stable. But uh, there are not that many inorganic pigments, more, there are more organic pigments. That's why the colors can be very vivid when they print the, these, these colors in the shirts and so on, actually. Um, there are many ways we can explain the color comes from. Uh, for example, uh, um, uh, if you know the electronic structure of these um, elements in the periodic table, uh, some of them containing what you call uh, transition metals, they have what you call uh, d electrons. The d electrons is responsible for the color. For example, cobalt in cobalt aluminum oxide, which is a, like, a, like a bottle, blue bottle actually, so contains cobalt 2 plus, which can give rise to a electronic excitation, which gives in the, in the range where it really reflects only the blue, it absorbs all the other radiation. Same thing with the malachite and turquoise, and also like a ruby and emerald, you have a chromium 3 plus, which is responsible for the color in your gemstones. But in the case of the other, other, other metal, like a Prussian blue, and then also in the case of sapphire, in those cases, the discharge transfer between one atom to another, another atom, like a sulfur to sulfur in the case of ultramarine, which is a lapis lazuli, actually, an actually occurring material, or there's a transition between oxygen and chrome, or metal atom, as in the case of barium chromate, which is a considered as a, a yellow pigment, actually. So there are other ways you can create colors, but most of the colors actually come from the, in inorganic, come from the um, uh, transition metal or metal uh, cations, which is present in the in the, in the crystal structure, just that's why the ruby is uh, red, and then uh, um, sapphire can be, you know, blue. So it's really a, um, a primarily done uh, by electronic transitions. So this is this is exactly happened when we. Have, I don't want to go into the details. This is probably a, I'm not sure how many of you are chemists here, but uh, it's really a, uh, the way what happened was. Yeah, yeah. So far, although the pigment is, industry is quite mature and there's a lot of work that's been done in pigment chemistry, but nobody has really thought about taking this 
special coordination, which is the five pole coordination surrounded by the indium and manganese as a, as, a, as a base for the pigment. So what we found was, although we are not looking for it, what happened was, whenever we had this, uh, oh, thank you. Yeah. So, um, the, 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 because the, 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 the manganese sits in a five pole coordination site, it, 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 it gives enough energy to transfer the electrons from the manganese within the manganese electronic level, which is shown here. Uh, that, sh that is controlled by the distance between this oxygen and this manganese atom, actually, which is again controlled by the indium being present of the indium in the same same position as with ma manganese. So uh, we have we have we have systematically studied this why the where the blue color comes from by by using theory and also electronic transition calculations actually. So clearly we understand the pipole coordination of this uh, uh, material in the material in the crystal structure is responsible for the color coming from the. For the um, we also proved that blue color can be now designed by staking different crystal structure again with the five pole coordinated manganese in the in, a, in another another material actually we actually designed it to create blue colors actually so by putting small amount of manganese as you can see it becomes a, a purple to blue whereas uh, without manganese the, the compound is only white actually so when you increase the manganese again it becomes darker blue so we can actually now uh, understand where the blue color comes from and why, uh, how we can design uh, uh, color compounds using this type of chemistry. When you publish this paper first uh, in, in, in the American Chemical Society, Journal of American Chemical Society, uh, and they, we didn't expect this could be such a, such a, 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 a publicity we are going to get because we have a patent filed by the YSU uh, because I was very familiar with the patenting um, because I have about 60 patents uh, from DuPont company uh, as an inventor, so I, I know there's some some value for this uh, discovery, so we decided to patent it. Then we published it. As soon as we published it, there was a lot of uh, um, um, the the somehow the the scientific editor of the Wall Street Journal got hold of it, and then he called me, and then he interviewed me, and then he he made an interesting interesting story. I thought he he wrote by happy accident chemists produce a new blue. Um, then it, it 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 kind of went all over the world. And you can see that this is from Germany, German magazine, this is from French magazine, Science and Life, this is from the Norwegian, uh, this is the chemical engineering news in the uh, American Chemical Society, and also this is the Indian newspaper, uh, the Hindu. So it was covered all over the world, So because there was no blue uh, pigments for 200 years, actually, which which I was not even aware, actually, that blue pigments are so hard to make. Uh, so the, the, I just want to give you a small, small interesting story about why the blue is so interesting. Um, there's an interesting book written by Philip Ball, who is a Nature magazine editor. Nature is a very famous journal from England, as you all know. Um, he actually wrote an interesting story about the, uh, the, color, the history of colors. The blue is the most difficult to make. The blue pigments in Middle Ages, nobody knows how to make it. It has to come from Af Afghanistan. Uh, we call them as a lapis lazuli. That's why when you, have, when you see a lapis lazuli as a gemstone, you, actually, this is actually a naturally occurring stone coming from only from Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, there are some in some in the South America, but it's not as good as good as of Afghanistan. So, uh, those days, all the pigments which which uh, painters used uh, in Sistine Chapel, and also some of the uh, some of the other Italian painters, especially Titian and also Lucio, and then uh, uh, those always used the blue pigments coming from the, the from uh, Afghanistan. And it, it was more expensive than gold at that time because blue is so difficult to make. Uh, and also, the, only the Italians had the, the painters had the uh, access to this uh, because they had a monopoly on the on getting the blue pigments from uh, uh, from from Afghanistan. But British art painters, John Constable is a well-known uh, well-known famous painter from Britain. He has, he has painted many of the natural scenes from uh, from uh, from, uh, from British uh, landscape. He, you can see that many of his painting has a very little blue actually. But okay, in England you don't have that much sunlight. Most of them it's cloudy. That's okay. But but the reason why he used, if you look at the story behind it, because blue is so expensive, he couldn't afford it actually. So he just tried to use a very minimum blue in his painting. Unlike uh, unlike Michelangelo, he, he painted mostly using a lapis lazuli in his Sistine Chapel, because um, that time the you know the, the Roman kings were so powerful and so so rich they could do it. So then the French. The, the French had a lot of problem because the French, what happened was, uh, French wanted painting, paint, uh, blue, blue pigments. So
So French government in 1800 gave, a, gave a, 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 a contest to all the chemists to come up with a reproduce the lapis lazuli in, in a synthetic way. Uh, see, in that time nobody knows the exact composition of lapis lazuli because it doesn't have any tungsten metal like manganese or copper or cobalt. It's purely a sulfur which gives rise to the color actually. Finally, in 1827, this chemist John Baptiste Gumal, he actually uh, successfully making the pigment, uh, artificial pigment, which is uh, similar to the lapis lazuli actually. So then only that was used by Renoir and Monet and uh, all, even Picasso used a lot of this uh, blue ultramarine for his painting because uh, we call them as a blue period, which was painted by the Picasso. So the blue is so it's so, it's so uh, interesting because the, the people in uh, in in um, um, uh, Italy, Italian painters always use it for using the uh, Virgin Mary and also the religious uh, it's called divine color actually blue. Uh, but later, in the, 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 the modern painters, you can see like Picasso, made it more like a for sad story when his, when his friend died, you know, he used everything uh, in 1900, he used blue as a depiction of the, uh, of the, of the sorrowness rather than a religious connotation. So, it has some interesting history behind all this, the blue, blue color actually. Uh, this is the blue um, ultra lapis lazuli, this is the crystal structure of the lapis lazuli, there is no transition metals. These are all sulfur clusters, as you can see, that produce the color actually, because electronic uh, transitions in the sulfur cluster give rise to the blue color. So, that was synthetically made in 1827. Uh, then the blue, cobalt blue was discovered in 1802, uh, which was the, the last blue color discovered, and when we discovered the blue based on this crystal structure, this was in 2000 and 2010, was after nearly 200 years actually, a, a, a blue pigment was discovered. So, this blue color is very vivid, and it's pretty much as good as ultramarine, but ultramarine is very unstable. It, that's why you can't uh, paint ultramarine in outdoors. You have to paint only in the indoors, like painters used it. But when you because any any touch of as, as acidic solutions, like uh, acid rain, can completely change the color to white. Actually, but in our pigments, they're highly durable. You make it very high temperature, as you can see, so it cannot be easily faded. Actually, so that's why the, the, it becomes a very popular. Uh, pigment for the blue pigment discovered uh, in, in, in recent years. There are so many companies are involved in uh, in, uh, the, in developing paints and pigments are uh, coated based on the uh, based on our pigments. The company which is uh, which is spearheading the whole effort is Shepard Color Company, where my student is working uh, with them because my student did uh, participate in my research. So he actually was immediately hired by Shepard Color Company so that he can he can he can develop this into a commercial pigment. Now the DISO, PPG, Nike. They all try to use them in plastics as well as in uh, in coatings, especially some of the companies like a Dura coat is used for military military applications, like in tanks and so on. See whether they can be uh, they can be better than what they paint today. And many of the museums have received samples from me. Uh, some of them are, uh, for example, um, even um, even a Pompidou in Paris, Museum of Modern Art, Lou Museum a Museum in Paris, Yale Museum of Modern Art in uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the Yale University, and also many artists worldwide as used use my painters to paint now uh, many of the pictures. I do have made some of the pictures. I'll show one painted by my wife who has, she has used these pigments quite a lot in painting, big paintings for the department actually. So we have a big painting uh, run by using our pigments. This is just for uh, uh, extracurricular <laughs> activities. See how these pigments can be used by the painters. Um, this is our, this all uh, obtained by the Shepard Color Company. Shepard Color Company has developed into a commercial pigment. And they actually has uh, evaluated our pigments and compared with the cobalt blue. The blue create effects the cobalt blue. Cobalt is carcinogen, so they cannot. Uh, they have to be very careful. The cobalt doesn't come out of the lattice very easily. So they really, uh, EPA is still allowed them to use cobalt aluminum oxide as a pigment, provided the cobalt won't leach out very really easily. Actually, so they compare the cobalt blue, which is used for painting the uh, paint roofs as well as painting the sidings, so for example, the, the, the vinyl sidings of the homes and so on. So you can see the comparison, the most important, for forget about this color scale, but the, the opacity and the gloss. The opacity of our pigments are very high, only one coating is enough for 90% to 99% hiding power, whereas the cobalt blue is about 75%. This is a 60 the gloss, 60 degree angle gloss. You can see that our painting produces much more glossy prints than the, the one used by the cobalt blue. So this, this is the only I'm comparing the blue, which is commercially available today, versus our blues actually. One of the other interesting in, uh, discovery we have made in these pigments are the are the these pigment compositions 
uh, can actually reflect infrared radiation. That means it can reflect heat from the sun. Uh, if you look at the, solar, the, the electromagnetic spectrum from the solar light, you can see that uh, the solar radiation consists of ultraviolet and visible rain, that's where you get all these the colors. And also the, there's a large proportions of the near infrared and far infrared. And the heat of the sunlight comes from because of this uh, radiation. So when you leave a car, your white, your, your, your black car in the sunlight, in the, in the in the sun, it gets very hot because it absorbs most of the heat from the sun, uh, from, from the sun radiation, so it gets very hot. If you have a white car, it reflects at least 60% of the sun's radiation actually. So it, that's why in a, in, a, in a very hot climate countries, like in, in the Middle East, people use mostly white cars because they really reflect quite a bit of sun radiation. Same thing in the case of the housing in like in Greece or in Turkey and so on. They're always white houses actually because it reflects a lot of sun uh, radiation. So, uh, but of course people like to have other colors, but unfortunately it, uh, it absorbs more heat. It makes it harder actually. But there's always interest in painting the roofs with the color with the colors or with the painting which can reflect uh, in, uh, infrared radiation. In California, there is actually a minimum standards you have to use to paint the roofs with pigments, where, with the paints which, are, which can reflect at least 20% of the uh, of the solar radiation. Um, so when when we when we did the uh, when when, when uh, uh, so Shepard Power Company did the evaluation of our pigment versus the cobalt blue, as you can see, it reflects nearly 90% of the near infrared uh, radiation. That means it can reflect most of the heat coming out of the out of the uh, out of the sun actually. In fact, this, this becomes more interesting for many companies, including Merck, uh, chemical company, which is also developing these pigments for the application of specialized coatings actually. So right now, if you have blue roof, if you see a blue roof in any buildings, you get that the only contain is cobalt blue, but cobalt blue absorption is about 95 percent, whereas our reflection is about 90 percent reflection. This is the percent of reflection from our pigment. This is actually the color coming from the visible green range. This is the heat from the from the uh, solar radiation actually. So that makes it more exciting for the many of the in, um, existing. So in, in fact our, our pigment can be tuned because when you have a high manganese content the solar radiation uh, reflection decreases so the presence of the indium is very helpful in getting the radiation uh, solar reflection is very high actually. So definitely there is a, 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 a in, simply the, not only the color of the pigments durability as well as the infrared reflection is very important to make this pigment more very uh, interesting for very, very interesting for the mini application, so we call them as a multifunctional pigments. In fact, uh, in fact, the Shepard Color Company has done a lot of work now. They they mixed our blue with the black, IR black, and then they can see the uh, the IR black is a not a very uh, high reflectance of solar uh, solar uh, near infrared solar radiation. But as you can see, our blue when they add to this black it actually increases the reflection, whereas the cobalt blue, when they add, it decreases the reflection. So definitely there is a, there is, you, can, you can formulate, that's what they said, you can formulate darker blue colors with a very high uh, solar reflectance using our pigments. In fact, that, that created a lot of interesting, uh, more, uh, more uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, uh, there's a beautiful article written in uh, uh, late 2012 about the, our blues, why they, are, they call them the color blue standard because it has all the properties and they call them the cool blues. National Geographic magazine did a, a small piece on called Next section in the February 2013 issue where I showed our blue pigments are, are the next the next generation pigments for solar reflectance, uh, especially the, uh, for cooling applications. The question now is, uh, uh, of course, we made these blue pigments as you know, not by design. We just found it and we know, we know how to make it, we know where the color comes from. But as you can see now the question is can we design other colors? Uh, so the, the idea is to take the serendipity to the uh, materials by design actually. Now we know what structures can we design other colors. Oh, this is actually a, a tulip. The tulips are one of the big uh, are, um, fields quite a bit in, uh, in Oregon. So there are some, this is a Mount Hood which is not very far from the Portland. So there's a lot of, it looks like a, 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 a Dutch countryside, but it is definitely a Oregon actually. Yeah. Um, we can actually design other colors now. Uh, we can make a green, we can make a lighter green, we can make a lot of darker green, we can make a orange, we can make brown, we can make turquoise. So we can actually change the color except the red. Red is very difficult to make in an organic pigment. We are still working on it, but still we don't have the handle on exactly how we are going to, to, to make it to work. We know we, we, can, we can make orange, but Bright red is more hotter actually. Uh, but the orange pigments, orange pigments what we did was, 
Instead of manganese, now we just simply use iron. In, in the same crystal structure containing indium, we actually, uh, um, so you, instead of just remove the complete the manganese and put some small, small amount of iron, again it sits in the same structure, same crystal structure, so in, instead of giving you blue, now we get an orange to bright, uh, um, uh, kind of a brown, but it is more, more like a dark, brick red color actually. So, it, 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 so we can create other colors. We can also create green pigments. Uh, green pigments is, uh, is again a most harder to make, uh, but they are, they, they, what we did was instead of manganese, what we did was we actually took both indium and manganese out. We put we replaced the manganese and indium by copper and titanium. Copper is two plus and titanium is four plus. The manganese there is three plus. So we can we create we mimic the same composition, same crystal structure, but you get a five pole coordination where you put copper and titanium. Now we can create a, 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 a green pigments. So uh, we can also make lavender, purple pigments. Purple pigments are made by, instead of, instead of uh, indium, we use gallium, gallium on minus X. We put small amount of manganese in this, this case. It, it, the blue is now, the electronic transition is changed such a way that we can actually shift more towards the red and make it more purple actually. So we can now tune the, tune the color of the material by using the structure we know which produces color. So there's a lot of possibilities in this uh, in this chemistry in, in this research. So I, I we are very excited about it because um, this is something we never thought I'm going to work in my in my lifetime actually working on pigments. But I worked on a lot of advanced materials like superconductors and electronic materials and so on. But it's so fascinating because it really definitely gives rise to a um, give rise to a um, kind of a, a new um, avenue for exploring inorganic um, compounds for other applications. Uh, one of the other things uh, interesting about the pigment research is always the history actually. Uh, pigments have been always uh, quite, uh, gems and pigments are always very powerful in the uh, Middle Ages actually. That is something which uh, quite a bit of things are known at that time. But in, this is an interesting story I actually published in American Mineralogist Journal. Uh, in, uh, in Middle Ages, they in France, they thought they found turquoise. French has no turquoise, believe me. There is no turquoise mines in France. But they found a, some material, when you heat it becomes turquoise color actually. So they thought uh, they are actually a turquoise gems, but they are not. They are actually fossils. Actually they are fossilized uh, mastodon ivory actually. Mastodon ivory is a calcium phosphate, just like our teeth actually. So they contain mostly calcium phosphate. So when they, when, 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 they, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the mastodons are, uh, um, they actually got um, um, uh, mammoths, we say mammoths, a similar, similar, similar uh, species. Um, they got extinct. All their, all their uh, tusks have become fossilized actually. So when you, when they remove the, these fossils and heat it, it becomes turquoise. Actually, the, the chemistry behind it has nothing to do with, with turquoise at all. And if you look at some of the museums in, uh, in France, this is in Paris Museum actually, you can see like a, they call it odontonite because it's a mushroom ivory actually. Now they know that. So they look like a, a, a turquoise gems, but they are actually a fossilized ivory. But what what is it about is a, a, a structure which is a calcium phosphate. The calcium phosphate structure, uh, which we call apatite, which is our, our teeth. Again, the teeth composition is very similar. That's why the, 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 we, we apply fluorine to make our teeth more, more uh, to prevent the cavities actually. So, but it contains, you know, when you have trace of manganese, other transition metals, they can induce colors. In fact, this is the structure of the ma mastodon ivory. When they heat it, some of the manganese goes into the crystal structure, becoming manganese 5 plus, manganese 5 plus in oxidation state. So when it is manganese 2 plus, it is white. When it is manganese 5 plus, it becomes blue. Then it becomes look at turquoise, actually. So you can see there's a nice publication done by uh, uh, a geophysical lab, American Mineralogist Journal actually, they published from Mastodon Ivory to Gemstone, the origin of turquoise color in odontonite. So, the, again, I, when I read this, I was thinking, maybe there, there should be a way to, we can create our own artificial turquoise pigments, why not? So, we choose a, a structure which is very similar to that uh, uh, calcium appetite, but containing tetrahedra and octahedra, just like a calcium appetite, but I know how to make this, because this, I have worked on this before. So we call them as a brown mineralite because it was a discoverer of a mineral uh, which contains octahedra and tetrahedra. And it's a very highly stable. Calcium phosphate pigments are not very stable to the acid because when, it, when you put acid, it will dissolve. But in this case, you know, these compounds are not uh, highly stable. So we choose that 
material structure and we put indium again in the manganese with the barium instead of yttrium actually. So what we found was turquoise pigments which is uh, you can see this is greenish blue mostly greenish blue so we can actually change the color of the pigments by again changing the manganese to indium ratio. So we could we now can create not only you know, that one type of crystal structures but we also can create blue pigments in other structures uh, or other colors in other structures which are highly stable. So, so we have come up with a chemistry knowledge now which can be expanded to, to design whatever the color we need and whatever the, whatever the stability you need these pigments. In fact, I, now I have been funded by many companies like a Merck company, DuPont company, try to design pigments with, with colors and stability and certain characteristics actually. So there is a quite a bit of interest in designing uh, uh, colors and also the pigments which are highly stable with our multifunctional characteristics. So this is actually, uh, we try to prove, you know, as you know, when you, are, when you are working in the university, you have to, students have to understand what is going on. The student who worked on this project, Feng, uh, Feng Jiang from China, actually, she actually graduated and got a job in J Beijing University. So she actually uh, did the calculations and she showed that um, the, 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 the electronic transition comes from, color comes from the, the tetrahedral site, not the trigonal by pyramid site, five port. It's only four oxygen surrounding the metal atom where the electron get transferred to the higher energy level. When the manganese 5 plus become manganese 3 plus by reducing in hydrogen, the color changes to black. That means the manganese 5 plus is responsible for the turquoise color actually. We also confirmed by electron spin resonance and other structures like chemical chemistry actually. It again published in just recently in, in American Chemical Society Journal. So we had a pattern now on this uh, covering all these uh, compositions and chemistry. So there was immediately issued because there is nothing in the literature known prior art known in the, in the whole area. So, so we published, we actually submitted the patent in 19, 2011 and we got it issued in 2012, so within a year actually. In fact, some of the, if you look at my, my earlier patents which is listed here, uh, novel tunable ferroelectric compositions, nothing to do with pigment, they are all uh, inorganic materials for electronic materials actually. So, so I, 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 I think, uh, uh, when I give to students this talk, I always say that, why we do research, why the research is so important actually. Um, that it, we produce a lot of colors now, we know how to make it. Color is always a fascinating to the civilization. If you go, if you have visited a French uh, countryside, there are, there, because I do teach in Bordeaux quite every year actually, I go there for a month. So not very far from the southwest France, there's a, there's a valley called Dodo, Dodo River actually. In that there's a lot of prehistoric paintings from uh, Neanderthal's paintings actually. So. Uh, they are 17,000 years old. They used mostly iron oxide pigments from the earth, and then they they created charcoal out of the coal to use the uh, make, make this uh, various different colors uh, with uh, outdoor paintings. Say Michelangelo used the same thing, naturally occurring minerals like uh, like um, 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 lapis lazuli for use for for, for painting. In, in his painting on the Sistine Chapel ceilings actually. So same thing. In the, there are there are places you go in in, in the world. Color becomes so fascinating. For example, in, a, in a, a small village in Bruno, Italy, not very far from Venice, uh, I had a chance to visit there, and you, you can see the color of the houses, are, everything is colored differently. That is actually dictated by the, by the township, what color you can put in our house, how it can, so they want to create such kind of a colorful uh, village, actually. It, it happens in many places in Europe, actually, where the color of the house gets dictated by, not by you, the, the township to tell you what color you can paint in the house, outside the house. Same thing in India, there's a big festival called Holi Festival, we, we, we celebrate with colors actually. Of course, the color has always been a fascinating for the cosmetic industry where the color becomes a, a huge uh, factor in terms of uh, uh, for the cosmetic purposes actually. Uh, this is a painting my wife made using the, using the, um, all the three different colors. She actually, when she showed up how, how she makes it, she has made a lot of paintings, although she's a chemist. She's also a solid state chemist just like me. She, worked with, uh, she also worked in DuPont actually with me. And uh, we did graduate, went to graduate school together. So she actually painted uh, many, many paintings using our pigment. This is actually displayed in uh, our chemistry department in the main office. Um, it's just a quite large size where she used the blue pigments for the blue color for the, she likes, uh, you know, blue heron. So she actually had a chance to paint the heron with the blue pigment from our calcium, yttrium, indium, manganese oxide the green from yttrium copper titanium oxide and the, uh, there's, all that, there's, a, there's a very famous painter in Portland, Oregon, in fact in, in, in the Portland airport they have a lot of our paintings. Uh, she actually used my pigments to paint uh, many of the, uh, I do have some pictures 
uh, writer, I can show you if you are interested actually. So there's a lot of painters, European painters I used my pigments to paint some of the, the, the it's not like the, this blue is so different from other blues. Painters always try to look for new pigments or new pig, pig, pigment composition because it, how, 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 how it uh, mixes with the palette and how it how it mixes, how the, how the strokes from the brush makes a big difference. Although I'm not a big painter actually, but at least that's what I heard from them actually. That's why they're always looking for new new pigments. Um, this this is again a talk uh, with, for the students mainly. I, I, I talk about this. If you look at the science itself, it's a chronicle of serendipitous discovery. Um, serendipity plays a very ma major role in the many of our many of the things we use in our world now. Um, but but serendipity, serendipity is not simply a stroke of luck. Uh, because when my, when my student came and showed me the blue color, I might have simply ignored it because it's not going to be an electronic materials. But the reason I know that blue is difficult to make, and blue is always a very difficult color to, to, to mimic in a, in a artificially. So when I saw the immediate, I recognized there's going to be a big discovery here, actually. So uh, although our holy grail is not to find the blue pigment, our holy grail was finding a interesting electronic material, which I just briefly explained in the beginning. But but the journey we took to find the blue, find that electronic material, led to the uh, blue discovery, actually. So. I always tell my students that uh, you are working on a very hard problem for reaching sometimes, sometimes it's very difficult. But if you work very hard, you can always find something interesting actually. Uh, because there are so many things happens in the in science which you can't control. If you, you can control everything, then it's easy to design whatever we want to design, but it, doesn't, it never happens. So this is an, a, a, a huge, uh, uh, this is an example recently as, uh, as a scientific example. So there are a lot of examples in the world, big discoveries have happened. Um, some of the spectacular discoveries uh, is uh, actually came from Dupont actually. Teflon, I'm, I'm sure you all know what is Teflon means. Uh, Teflon is one of the most highly used product uh, polymer in the world actually. It was never uh, discovered by rational design, it was totally accidental. When a chemist named my, uh, um, the, oh my I think uh, Roy Plunkett, his, his name is Roy Plunkett, he actually in 1938, he actually bought a cylinder of tetrafluoroethylene for using for making what you call uh, the refrigerants, not all polymers at all, refrigerants. But when he bought the cylinder, he opened the uh, cylinder, no gas came out actually. So tetrafluoroethylene cannot go out easily. Uh, so he decided that uh, to explore that why there is no gas in the cylinder. So you weigh the cylinder, there's a weight. That means there is, there is still gas inside maybe. But he knows there's no gas coming out. So he took a drill, drill and he drilled the cylinder. Imagine, today you can't do it in an industry to drill a cylinder, actually a gas cylinder. Then he found a white powder that was Teflon. Nobody knows how to polymerize Teflon, make Teflon before actually. Then Dupont spent 10 years of outstanding um, polymer chemists have to go back and then reproduce that actually. It took 10 years. It, it, Teflon was commercialized in 1950s. As you can see that 1938 was the first he observed that the Teflon inside the cylinder. So not a single experiment made before that uh, to, to, to develop Teflon. Ethereum, is another example with the post-it. Post-it is so popular because you can remove it without destroying the other surface actually. That's why it's easy to peel off. In fact, the chemists were not looking for the bad uh, glue. They were looking for the super glue actually. But the, the glue they discovered is so bad. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, 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 it peels off all the time. And finally somebody thought, why everybody wants a super glue? Because sometimes you do want to remove it maybe. You know, why don't we come up with a product based on this, they, you can write it, you can remove it, because white always fix permanently everything into the wall or into the desk actually. So, in fact, it's innovation as well as it is a discovery actually. So I tell my students, even if you're a bad chemist, you can make billions of dollars. Because uh, you don't need to be an outstanding chemist to make billions of dollars actually. So this is another example. Other example is the Viagra. Viagra is a drug we all know is quite well used for men's issues. But, you know, it's, it, 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 it's more than simply a of course, if you, whenever I give, say about it, people laugh. But this is a big money maker for Pfizer, actually. But if you look at the discovery based how the how the Viagra was discovered, you'd be really surprised, actually. Nobody knows how to make drugs for to, to curing that problem, actually. So what they, they they were not even looking for it, to be honest, because they tried and gave up, actually. So yeah, when they when, when the two chemists in uh, England. In, uh, in Pfizer labs, they made this chemical formulation rationally designed to, re to reduce the blood pressure actually. So they, it did not work. Uh, they tried and tried and it did not work. And they did some trials. 
both men and women they gave the drugs they did the trials only women when they, when they didn't work out they wanted to get the, all the medication back only women gave back men did not give back actually um it, it this is an, this is a true story you can be, it was in, it, it it is now in you can you can go to the pfizer website you can see it it was in cosmopolitan magazine can you believe that in a, a chemistry discovery actually yeah, because this is again it's easy to you can't ignore this discovery because Pfizer has made 15 billion dollars so far since 1988 actually, that's 1998, that was, that was the year which was introduced. In fact, they're so scared of getting the patent, patent you know, uh, <laughs> going to expire. They try to keep on trying to find something, modification, so that the, the generic drug people like in India and China, they won't go and make those things actually. So they, it's a huge money maker actually. Same thing with the uh, uh, discovery of a pigment in Middle Ages, non Middle Ages, about 1800s, is uh, Perkins dye. Perkins dye is the first dye, the purple dye, which is normally used by royal, because the purple is so rare those days, it can only, the royal families can use purple actually, even the commoners cannot use actually. So when the Perkins discovered this dye in England, it, it, that's why you have a Perkins transaction journal and so on, he's a very famous chemist. He actually, when he discovered, he was not looking for the dye. He was actually looking for an anti-malarial drug, actually, uh, which is Mauvin. So that is actually a, a Perkins dye, which is nothing but now we know this aniline-based uh, dyes, actually. So um, he made an industry out of it, finally, and then he made a quite a bit of money of using the, using the purple dye. So recently, our blue is the same thing. After 200 years, you know, everybody was looking for it and gave up. Now, the more I, more I know about it, people always said, I've been make, trying to make a blue for a long time, but I couldn't make it for the past 200 years. Now we have come across this blue accidentally, to be honest, uh, without any. Uh, yeah, that time we didn't even plan to work on pigments. Actually, how the how, how it happened. So definitely, there. I always tell my students that don't feel bad that if you don't discover um, in a planned way. Sometimes it doesn't work that way. Many of the big discoveries, pencil in pencil in to Woodier, Woodier vulcanization to everything is all uh, accidental discoveries. I think that I'm going to stop there, and then uh, uh, I, I, I hope uh, you know, it was kind of an uh, interesting story how we discovered the pigment and where, how far it has gone so far. Actually. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Um, so you use uh, some transition metals in the compound, right? Yes. So did you try all the transition metal, or how, what was the rational line for selecting? Uh, most of the time, we know the number of uh, electrons in the transition metals. Um, uh, for example, we know the copper electronic configuration. We, you know, normally copper gives rise to the transition which is close to the green or blue. Uh, manganese can be green or blue, uh, but iron can be more reddish. That's why you get. So we have some intuition, but that doesn't mean you're going to design create because, you know, in addition to the electronic transition, the crystal structure is extremely important actually. Because the, the structure, the bonding, local bonding, like in the case of manganese oxygen distance. In fact, I can create a, a, a lighter blue to the darker blue because I change the bond distance in the crystal lattice. We have studied very detailed neutron diffraction work and so on. We have, we have done a lot of work on this. So it is a it is certain amount of chemical intuition and also a certain amount of understanding of the crystal structure and, and the electronic transitions. Uh, but uh, in some guys, sometimes it, it, it surprises us, but uh, most of the time it's, it, it works actually. Uh, the, the important part of our discovery is, is the, the, the special coordination of this manganese within a pi-fold coordination. Normally you have octahedra and tetrahedra, am I right? But in, the, in this case you have pi-fold coordination. That pi-fold coordination is uh, important for the color transition because it gives an intense color actually, which nobody has done before. In fact, when you find the pattern which was so quickly accepted because there is nothing in the literature known before this coordination is useful. So our whole purpose of designing the solids for electronics, creating this magnetic and electronic material actually very, uh, was purely based on the electronic configuration. That didn't work actually the way we wanted to do it. So that's, that's part of the science actually. When you do discovery research, you're always going to find something unexpected actually. But it, it, it is something where, which I learned a lot in DuPont Company. I have to say this, many professors, when they come as a young professor, they don't have any experience of working in industry. It's not easy for them to translate a, a discovery. Students make it sometime in, uh, to other areas. Um, one of the example, when, uh, when, when I was in Dipan in 2002, 
I made a discovery of making fluorobenzene from benzene, but I'm not an organic chemist, and I don't like organic chemistry that much because there's only three elements you work with, <laughs> carbon, hydrogen, and and uh, sometimes oxygen, sometimes, you know, some, uh, some nitrogen, sometimes like aniline. Um, but there was a challenge in DuPont, how can you make a fluorobenzene from benzene directly, actually? Uh, it, again, the, the last chemistry called Borshiman chemistry was done about nearly 120 years back and people still following it. So then I thought, why don't I use my inorganic knowledge to see whether I can make an organic product? So I simply took the benzene molecule, to react it with copper difluoride. Copper difluoride containing fluorine. One fluorine goes into the benzene ring, forming a fluorobenzene. Other, comes a HF and copper metal. Now I can take copper metal, reoxidize in air with HF, it becomes copper fluoride again. So I created a chemistry of benzene to fluorobenzene directly, which is never to be made before. It was published in Science, and then it was also patented by DuPont. Um, so he, simply by understanding the copper fluoride chemistry more than the organic chemistry, actually. So that was commercialized by ICI. Uh, uh, I think the DuPont got about $35 million for licensing the patent, actually, yeah, so far. So, uh, that was the, when I published in science, uh, I, I, I'm not an organic chemist. Then the Community Engineering News um, uh, selected as one of the outstanding discoveries in organic chemistry. <laughs> that one. People even thought it thought my name, actually. Somebody thought maybe somebody else, because <laughs> I, I never worked on organic chemistry before. So, I, the, way, the way I tell my students is, you are not limited to one area, actually, provided you understand the basic undergraduate chemistry. What I most of the time I use is undergraduate chemistry, to be honest. Yeah. But you have to have a strong, uh, you know, strength in the undergraduate foundation, undergraduate chemistry. So undergraduate teaching is an important part of the whole the curriculum, what we do, actually. In fact, I teach undergraduate class voluntarily. I don't need to teach. I don't have a, I only have to teach one graduate course uh, in, in a whole year, actually. That's my contract because uh, I'm an endowed chair, so they don't, they don't pay me from the department. I'm paid by the foundation, actually, am I right? So my, my salary comes from the Research Foundation because it was an endowment given by Milton Harris. Milton Harris, as again, my name is Milton Harris Professor. I, I'm very delighted because but Milton Harris is an innovator, actually. You know, the, now you shave, men shave, we're using this uh, Gillette blades, which is Mac 3 and then Mac 4 and all kinds of things. The reason why you are able to use it because he is the first person to show how to coat Teflon on, on razor blades. Believe me, it doesn't hurt you at all anymore. People don't get cuts all over, actually. In the earlier days, it was a common thing, actually. And so he actually made millions and millions of dollars by licensing that technology to Gillette. So finally, his lab called Harris Labs was bought up by Gillette, actually. And he won a big uh, Perkins Award. Again, he actually won the Perkins Award, to be honest. So. I think, I think you look at all these people, chemists, you know, who really did not work on the area where they are uh, where they specialized, actually. They could actually think in a cross-interdisciplinary way. But to some extent, I strongly believe undergraduate education is an important part. You, what school you are in, it doesn't matter, actually. Yeah, so I, I always tell my, my, my at least my uh, department faculty, we need to find a great teacher for undergraduate. I don't care about graduates. Graduate education is students are pretty mature, you know, they, they, they get excited, that's why they're in a graduate school. But to get these ex students excited in undergraduate level is the most hardest thing. I teach a course called First Year Experience. I don't know whether you guys have the similar thing here, First Year Experience. Uh, the only reason they, I, I volunteered to do it because they asked me, you well, come from industry after 24 two years, you need to help us to get the students to stay in chemistry. It's not easy sometimes because they get all this you know, attractive things going on in other areas, like make more money, make more, more interesting stuff. To keep them in, in chemistry, it's not an easy thing, actually. So, that is something, I, so every time I give a talk, I talk about the excitement of doing research and how you can, you can be successful, actually. Yeah. So, yesterday I said, hey, in the Clinton School, I went to the Clinton School, they asked me to go and give a talk. I talked about the, in general, yeah, general, how the way the chemistry is so fascinating, actually. I mean, I've never done anything in my life. Now, I, one of the most fortunate thing in my case is, I could work on this such an area where a periodic table become like a hobby actually for me actually. I don't have that much hobbies, believe me, I know that. I go to the lab all the time. But people always say, do you have a life? I said, oh, I have maybe more lives than other people. Only thing you don't know that actually. Because <laughs> when you create new things, I made about thousands of new compounds, thousands of different things I have made. So I, I think that excitement, Students will not be brilliant, believe me, because my parents, they will tell me, they will tell you that how bad I was in school, actually. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying it's normal, am I right? It happens sometimes. So, uh, 
it just you have to develop the interest. I got interested in chemistry, for, uh, you know, when I was in, in a, you know, in final years in school actually because of the chemistry teacher. Believe me, yeah, the adult teacher makes a difference in the uh, especially in the undergraduate level as well as in the freshman level actually. Yeah. So we always have to develop some very good teachers who who, who motivate the students to stay in science or stay in engineering or stay in other areas. Actually. I have one more question. Uh, sure. So many uh, dyes are not being used in cosmetics and foods also. Uh, they, they, they are, that's an issue actually. Yeah, there, are, there are food colorations synthetically made, yeah. but that should be approved by FDA actually. Yeah. So like um, I, I, I sometimes read like they have some adverse health effects. So do you know about that? Which one? <clears throat> like they, they have some harmful effects on health. Oh, yeah? So what, this pigment you mean? Uh, the dyes. Oh, dyes? Well, uh, the, the, in the case of dyes, the food color, food dyes are most difficult to want to make. That's why the, you don't have that much blue foods actually. Although you have blue M&Ms, which is uh, again a synthetically made, uh, artificially made dye actually, which is, uh, which is allowed by the FDA. But there is a research going on in the, in the dyes area coming from naturally occurring um, um, fungus and so on, which uh, you know, in the in the case of especially, it's difficult to cook colors, pigments, or colored dyes, because when you heat, this they change the color. That's why you can't use a, a blueberry to cook and make a blue solid actually, because it will it will eventually change the color actually. So they what what they're doing? They're going to the Yellowstone National Park and they're finding this uh, all these geysers. There are some fungus growing, color color fungus is growing, growing in a hot. You know, so in, in those things, they are taking it and see whether they can be used as a dye for the, for the food coloration. There was an interesting article about a year back uh, in the uh, Journal of American Chemical Society about the naturally occurring blues, which can be used for blue, blue color, blue foods actually. Yeah. But I don't know whether I want to eat a blue rice, but I, I, I'm not sure. But still, the reason why the blue is not so popular because we don't we don't have experience of eating a blue food actually. It is, it, it is very uh, amazing because when you, you want a blue bottle, when you want to put a water in that, there was a lot of myth about that, you know, having a blue bottle is the best for the game, showing water actually. So I think, I think it is an, uh, it, it's an interesting color for the objects but not for the food. But there are people are trying to create uh, uh, colors for the food. It's a very big industry actually, uh, especially uh, Procter & Gamble and others are really looking for UF making food coloration. Thank you. Any other questions you have?